Hi everybody, I'm Jeremiah Reiner, and thank you again for joining us for a brand new episode of Deeply Rooted. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Deeply Rooted. I'm Jeremiah Reiner, your host, and as always, thank you for tuning in and taking time out of your day to be with us on the podcast. We hope you've appreciated all the ones that we've given so far up to this date. We've got a lot there on our YouTube channel. We'd love for you to reach out to us on there or through our Facebook page at Deeply Rooted. We'd love to hear from you. If you've got questions and like to reach out to us, we'd be glad to answer those for you and be in conversation. There are things that seemingly war against us, and I use that term very carefully, war against us, because I believe it is a battle. They compete for our minds and our hearts and our worship and our love and our relationships. It's tactics that the enemy has used to lure us down certain paths, and sometimes these things can be overwhelming, and at other times they can be destructive. And that leads us to the question today, what do we do with these things that are continually pulling us away from our Lord? Instead of going towards culture and and reading things that we possibly could by secular writers, let's dig into the Word of God today. Let's turn to Mark chapter 5, and the Gospels is going to be our text. We're going to pick up in verse 22. Jesus has been ministering in Decapolis, and even in Capernaum, in verse 22, it says, And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death, and I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And verse 24 says, And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him, and thronged him. The point we want to make today in a couple of different sections here throughout this passage is that when it comes to these things that are continually competing against us and overwhelming us and leading to destruction, Scripture teaches here in this passage that we are to lay these things down at the feet of Christ. The first one we see here is burdens. These heavy loads, these things that continually weigh us down, This man here has come to Christ, and he's got a terrible situation. His daughter is extremely sick. Notice she's not dead yet. And he begins to bring this situation to Jesus, and verse 22 says that he fell at his feet. And he goes on to say that that he asked him, and he prayed, Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. He's got this great faith here, but he puts it in the correct location, this terrible burden on this man, and anybody in this situation would be at a point of desperation. And notice that in the entire situation, there's large crowds in verse 24, and yet the Bible says Jesus went with him. This stampede of people, this loud crowd, and yet there's beauty here because Jesus doesn't get distracted. Scripture literally says Jesus went with him, even though there were crowds of people following him, and the word there, throng him, means literally a stampede, a a massive crowd of people almost running them over. I love what the psalmist says in Psalm 37, verse 25. It's David speaking, and he says, I've been young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. That's good news for us today when we understand that although we may have these heavy burdens, when we bring them to Christ and lay them down at His feet, not trying to take care of them in our own power, but laying them down, we get the promise that Christ is not distracted. The righteous are not going to be forsaken. He goes on to say here in verse 25, still in Mark chapter 5, And a certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. 
and when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind him and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Verse 30 says, And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came, and here it is again, fell down before him, and told him all the truth. And he said unto her daughter, Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. So in the first passage there, we see Jairus, and we learn that we have to lay burdens down. But here, an all different situation, right in the same place as this massive crowd, this woman comes up behind him, grabs his garment there in the bottom, and Christ heals her. Now this situation, though, to many people, including her, seemed impossible. And that's the second point that we want to make today of the things that we need to lay down. Not only the burdens that we have, but these, seem, these seemingly impossible things in our life. But notice, there's nothing to go back to with her. There's, there's no place to dwell anymore. All the hopelessness and emptiness and defeat and everything behind her. She has nothing to turn to. Scripture says in verse 26, she'd suffered many things of many physicians and spent all that she had. She has absolutely exhausted all of her options and resources. And it says later on, nothing was bettered, but only grew worse. We have to learn to lay down these seemingly impossible things to Christ. You and I, in and of ourselves, do not have the capacity to overcome these things. And understand something. Jesus Christ still takes great delight in impossibilities. It reminds me of a story I read not too long ago about a young boy. He was going to visit his grandparents. And he had taken with him on the plane ride his Sunday school lesson. And he was reading it over and sitting next to him was an elderly man who happened to be a seminary professor. And the man noticed what the young boy was reading and he began to gauge in conversation with him and introduce himself and they struck up a talk. And eventually the airline attendant had brought their food around. And the man leaned over very carefully and was noticing what the boy was reading and the lesson was on the power of God. And he thought he'd just really kind of put a smile on the boy's face, and he says, All right, son, I'll tell you something. If you can tell me one thing that God can do, I'll give you my apple. And the boy looked down at his Sunday school lesson and then looked back up at the man. He said, Sir, if you can tell me one thing God can't do, I'll give you an entire barrel of apples. And isn't that the kind of faith that you and I should be looking for and pursuing? When we look at the power and the almighty and we just stand back in awe and realize there's nothing impossible for him. I love what it said in Matthew 19, 26. With God, all things are possible. One of my favorite passages in all the scripture, Jeremiah 32, 17. The prophet says, I, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm. And there is nothing too hard for thee. We have to take these seemingly impossible situations and lay them down at the feet of the miracle maker. Verse 35, picking up in that same passage. And while he yet spake, there came from the rule of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Now we just got caught up in a situation in the beginning. We were looking at Jairus in this situation with his daughter. And then out of nowhere, this young lady comes in who had spent everything she had, had searched out all the physicians, and she had this terrible issue of blood. And right on the way to Jairus' house to visit his daughter, this lady gets the miracle. And we sit there, and easily in verses 34 and 35, if we put ourselves in Jairus' shoes, there's got to be jealousy. Because when we see this thing happen, and yet we've taken time out of our day that we could have went to our so-called situation, and then we get the news in verse 35 from his own house that his daughter is dead. 
And then they rub salt in the wound, because the rest of that verse says this from these people. Why troublest thou the master any further? You've got to think in your mind, if you're Jairus, that everything that you know just got pulled right out from under you. You thought for sure Christ is going to show up at your home. He's going to heal your daughter. Everything's going to turn out all right. But instead, not only did your daughter die, but someone else was given a miracle that day. And in your mind, you know there's going to be great deep anger. Verse 36, this is the heart of God. And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, but only believe. I love that verse because it showcases that Christ is not distracted. He is aware of every single person. Scripture says that he knows the number of hairs on our head, and certainly he would know in this moment what Jairus is going to. And instead of looking at the crowd and looking at the person that brought the news or celebrating with that lady who had just been healed, he immediately turns to Jairus and confronts the issues in his heart. Be not afraid, only believe. Verse 37 goes on to say, And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John the brother of James. We see this situation playing out, and in our heart of hearts, we have to admit this. This situation looks difficult. And we look at this and think, surely there's no way Christ is going to show up here if we're in the shoes of Jairus, and he's going to heal his daughter. But he picks Peter and James and John, and as he's looked at that young man, Jairus, he looks at these men, be not afraid, only believe. The third point we want to make here is something that I want to go back to in verse 35 when these people look and say, why troublest thou the master any further? It seems that we tend to give up on Christ so easily. And the third point we want to make here that we need to lay down, we need to lay down the trivial things of life. So often we think that there are just minor details of life that we don't need to take to Christ because, as it says, why troublest thou the master any further. Here's a good point to make. If you're too busy for ministry, you're too busy. It is absolutely amazing at the trivial, temporary things that we neglect Christ for. These idols of entertainment and idols of sport and idols of pleasures and hobbies that we walk right out on Christ for. There was a survey done a couple of years ago by the NCAA it found that less than 2% of college athletes play professional sports and less than 1% of high school athletes. As a matter of fact, six-tenths of a percent of high school athletes play professional sports. And yet, we exhaust our time, our resources, our energies, our peace of mind, it's everything it seems like to pursue these scholarships and hopes and dreams that we might have of being playing sports for money possibly, and yet the statistics tell us it is extremely rare that someone would be gifted enough to play professionally. But look at how easily we walk out on Christ for all these trivial, temporary things. You say, is sports wrong? Absolutely not. I played them myself and am still involved. But there comes a time and place where you have to realize, are we working for things that are trivial or things that are eternal? In the same sense, Statistics tell us that 183 million people in the United States play video games. And by the age of 21, the average person has accumulated almost 10,000 hours played. Staggering. And roughly 24 less hours than they would have accumulated if you had perfect attendance through your middle school and high school years. And another alarming number to go right with this trend Per week on this planet, people spend 3 billion hours playing. Now again, this is not a message against video games. Video games in and of themselves are not immoral. But when you look at the idea of how we neglect Christ for such trivial things, at best it's embarrassing. April 2016, Barna Group ran a study as well, 73% of people here in this country identify as Christian. 
And yet less than 35% say that they attend church on a weekly basis. The point I'm trying to make with all these numbers throwing at you is this. 100% of those people will meet Jesus Christ at the judgment. And nowhere in Scripture are we told that we will be able to use these trivial things that we've pursued as somehow a reason to negate us going to hell but slipping into heaven. Jesus Christ himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so when you look at that verse again, why troublest thou the Master any further? We ought to be at his feet continually. Jesus Christ is not troubled with our petitions. He asked for us to bring them to him. Even the trivial things of life, we need to lay down at the feet of Christ, seek his word, and find out what he has to say about all these things. Everything about us, heart, mind, soul, spirit, should be governed by the Lordship of Christ. Moving on in verse 38. He cometh to the house of the rule of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that willed greatly. Interesting fact here on the side, there were actually people who were prof professional mourners. As odd as that may sound, people were actually paid to come in and mourn over the loss of people. So when the Bible says in verse 38 that there was a tumult and he saw these people that wept and well great, there's, there's a really odd scene being played out here. And he's coming in here to literally raise this girl from the dead. And this almost chaotic scene erupts as they show up. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. Now just for a moment, before we jump into the next couple of verses, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of not only Jairus, but his wife. When you see your husband bringing this man back with these three other strangers, and instead of jumping in and being mournful and crying and, and trying to offer some encouragement and being sympathetic, instead he literally looks at these people and says, What's all the fuss about? Why are you weeping? Now in our modern culture... Most people, folks, would have thrown him out. Many people would have probably called the police and asked him to be removed. Almost in a sense, thinking, what a heartless comment to make. And of all the situations going on, certainly she's also got to be upset with her husband. How dare you leave and come back and this is all you come back with while your daughter is now dead. Verse 39 Excuse me, verse 40 goes on to say, And they laughed him to scorn. I wonder how many times Jesus has spoken into our life through his word, and clearly we should step back and say, The Lord has this under control. But when we look at the situation, we almost laugh at thinking that somehow he can do something with this. I'd have to agree in verse 40, I've probably done that just as many times as these people. I've almost mockingly said that Christ doesn't have the power to do these things. And what I'm in essence saying is, I don't have the faith to believe that God could intervene. Verse 40 goes on to say, though, but when he had put them all out. I love the fact that sometimes God gets us out of the way so that he can get right in the middle of a situation. Instead of trying to weed through our doubt, he simply overrides it. It says here, He taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, referring to Peter, James, and John, and entered in where the damsel was lying. Verse 41 says, And he took the damsel by the hand, and he said unto her, Talithia kumai, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, Arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it and commanded that something should be given her to eat. The last point we want to make and the thing that we need to lay down at the feet of Christ is we've also got to lay our guard down. Many of us in the situation of Jairus there and his wife would have asked Christ to leave and sometimes even ferociously ask him to leave. We have got to learn to be vulnerable and open ourselves up to the power of Jesus Christ. We have to open up our heart, open up our homes, open up our eyes, open up our ears, open up our minds, open up our hands, allow Him to use our feet to go and do 
and glorify the Lord, but in order to do that, we've got to let our guard down. Understand something. His desire is to help, not harm. We see that in verse 42, as it says at the end, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. No one in that room thought at all, other than Christ himself, that that young lady could be raised from the dead. And you and I will have the same astonishment if we will lay down our guard and open up to Jesus Christ and what he's capable of. I don't think many professing Christians understand the power that Christ has to revolutionize their life in ways that they desperately needed. Ways that he could teach us vulnerability. Ways that he could teach us to love other people. Ways that he could teach us to serve other people. To pray for other people. To share the gospel. To be a bold witness. I don't think we've even tapped into the knowledge and understanding of what we're capable of when we allow Christ to work through us and let our guard down. It's interesting when you see this story. Jesus is just passing by. And we see these people in desperate situations, including that massive crowd that was following, and certainly people in that crowd needing help. And I wonder today if you listen to this message and you think, I wonder if Christ is passing by in my life. Absolutely, because we've just opened His Word and He's speaking to us through His Word and reminding us we have to lay things down. And that's my question to you today. What is it that you need to lay down? Is it your pride? Is it a burden that you've had? Maybe like these people, you've got to lay down your guard. Maybe it's the trivial things in your life that you spend so much time and energy and resource and all these things that you just accumulated for nothing, only to find out it's absolutely trivial and nothing of this is eternal. Maybe it's those things that we need to lay down. Maybe it's the impossible things in our life that we think there's no way that God could intervene and do something here. And yet we read these passages of Scripture, and we have to understand that the book of Hebrews still tells us Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same Christ that we read here that had the power over Jairus' daughter and over this woman with the issue of blood is the same Jesus that occupies the throne of heaven today. He is capable of not only making a difference, but making the difference in your life. If you've never been saved, if you've never called on Christ and repented of your sins and laid that down at His feet, I highly encourage you, I would almost beg you today to do that. Because Scripture tells us this, that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is us laying it down at the feet of Jesus, surrendering our life, everything about us over to Him, and receiving grace and mercy and love and forgiveness that we do not have to earn because He has fully paid our debt to God on Calvary. And Christians, I would encourage you, if there's things in your life that are hindering your relationship with Christ, do as this passage has taught us. Lay these things down. Open up to Christ. Return back to that first love that you have. And as He's passing by, don't waste the opportunity. Don't waste the opportunity. We love you so much. Thank you again for joining us here on Deeply Rooted. We'll be right back with some closing announcements. And until next time, God bless and hope you all have a great week. Jeremiah again here real quick with some closing announcements. We're on the heels of our election here in our country, and it's easy to get caught up in the muddy waters of politics, and certainly it would be an easy trail to run down, and we often want to get angry and bitter about certain situations, but just a word of encouragement here for us as believers to live holier. Um, We are commanded in Scripture to pray for our leaders, whether locally or state level or nationally. It's a difficult task and an unenviable task, in my opinion, to be a public servant. Uh, with as much criticism and hatred and and nastiness, it seems like, these days that are involved in politics. I believe it's our duty and responsibility as followers of Christ to pray for these people, to lift them up, uh, to encourage where encouragement needs to be, 
Uh, instead of grabbing stones and, and wanting to be quick to judgment, let's be quick to prayer instead. Understandably, these people are human, and they are prone to wonder, as the song says, and absolutely they'll make mistakes. And many times, I'm sure, they will be unbiblical mistakes. Uh, but it is our responsibility as believers in Christ to pray for these people, and I would encourage you to do that. So before we cast that stone of judgment, how about we get on our knees and ask God and petition Him for help and support and discernment and wisdom. Now, on another note, and certainly a more positive note, uh, this November, uh, in the latter part of the month, uh, we've got a special opportunity to be in revival services with the good people of Cedar Ridge Baptist Church. That is going to be taking place from November 25th all the way through November 30th, Lord willing. We're going to kick that off at 6 o'clock on Sunday night on November 25th, and we will be continuing services all the way through the 30th, as I just said. The 26th to the 30th, which is Monday through Friday night, those services are going to start at 7 p.m. So if you are able to be with us in service, and we hope you are, uh, please remember the time change there. Sunday night, 6 o'clock. Monday through Friday will be 7 o'clock. I've got some great friends in the ministry uh, that are going to be partnering with us there to be preaching all throughout that week. We will have special worship music each night as well. I've got the privilege to share the word that night on the 27th. That's the Tuesday night of the revival. So please be in prayer as we seek to lift up the name of Jesus Christ and have what I believe is, is needed revival for the saints of God. And certainly we want to proclaim the gospel and share that to those that may be far from God. I'd ask you again that you would pray for us as we, we seek these services and we seek to proclaim the word of the Lord as best we possibly can and be a servant for him. And pray for all those other ministers and leaders in music as well throughout that week. If you get an opportunity, please come down and be with us. Again, that's Cedar Ridge Baptist Church. It's located in the Big Stone Gap area. If you'd like more information, you can reach out to us here on our Facebook page at Deeply Rooted. Also, please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel if you'd like to hear and listen to any of the other previous podcasts that we've recorded and the interviews as well. They're all on there for your listening pleasure. Until next time, we love you guys, God bless you, and hope you have a fantastic week.